to see this. When I was a kid, there was one game that I had that no matter how many times I tried, I, I just could not beat. It was Pokemon Stadium 2. The Elite Four in that game were notoriously difficult. And when you consider the fact that you only had these like really crappy rental Pokemon, it felt a lot of times like, like all the odds were stacked really highly against you. So that's why when revisiting it for a project I was working on, I did so through emulation so that I could exploit the game and make it actually possible to capture footage of the final battles. Originally I was planning a video on the architecture of Pokemon, the design patterns used in designing the software structure. Two snags though. The original Pokemon games I was looking at were written in C, meaning modern reverse engineering tools wouldn't work. There weren't any classes back then, just structures. Second, when looking into the more modern games, really the most interesting thing was an application of the builder pattern, which is cool and all, but I can't really make a whole video on that, that'd be pretty short. Okay, look, here's the gist of it. You know how there are multiple contexts in which Pokemon can appear? From inventory to box, from battles to fashion shows? Yeah, well this special builder ensures that only the attributes of a Pokemon that are needed given a context are carried into each situation. Yep, cool, that's it, video done. Welcome to the end screen. Hello, and welcome to the end screen. But here's the thing. While playing and messing around with imports and exports of game save states, I noticed something really interesting that would have been impossible to observe without performing such exploits. And this discovery, while behaviorally insignificant, has forever changed the way I'll look at old Pokemon games. So let's break down one of the main mechanics in Pokemon. Attacking. Pokemon is a turn-based game where each player picks an action, and then these actions are executed during an action phase. During that execution is where the majority of the game's combat-related processes occur, where damage is calculated, health is reduced, and probabilities are applied. The attack Thunder, for example, being as powerful as it is, only has a 70% chance of hitting its mark. Here it comes! Thunder! The other 30% it'll just miss and the turn will be wasted. So what I always assumed was that during runtime, during that action phase where the game just processes the outcome of a turn, I assumed that that was when the game would decide whether or not an attack would hit. You know, you choose the move Thunder, the attack starts, a random number is generated, and based on it the game decides what the attack will do. But that's why I was careful before. I said that this is the point at which probabilities are applied not processed. Because unbeknownst to the player, the outcome of every move in the game is determined before a match even begins. Now, full disclosure, I haven't actually seen the lines of code that do this because C just isn't very readable to people like me who've been raised under the graces of Java. But even if I had, it wouldn't have really mattered because the Pokemon Red source I was working with wasn't actually reused when making the N64 Stadium games. So while I can't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is exactly how it is, the explanation I'm about to give of how the game works is functionally identical to however it's actually implemented. After some research though, I'm kind of leaning towards it being a pretty accurate assumption though. So basically, instead of generating random numbers as needed when attacks are launched, before the start of a match, a whole collection of random numbers are generated and stored in some sort of structure. Then, as the game runs, once an attack is selected, rather than the attack itself performing the necessary processes to determine if it'll hit or not, the system instead just pops a number off the top of a random collection and hands it to the attack to make all of its checks. So quickly, let's go over the basics of making decisions with random numbers. Which, by the way, is in no way accurate to how the game works, I'm, I'm just giving you some base understanding of how this typically goes on. So let's say each random number generated is between 0 and 100. Now when the thunder attack is called, a random number is passed to it for processing. Since the accuracy of thunder is 70%, the program might check if the number is less than or equal to 70, which assuming perfect statistical randomness in the number generator has a 70% chance. Then if that passes, another check might be done to see if the number is for example not just lower than 70 but also lower than 5 aka a 5% chance. If so, the move won't just land, but maybe it'll be a critical hit or something. So that's how you make meaningful decisions from, you know, a random number. So back to the game kind of pre-generating a bunch of random numbers. From my testing, I've cornered the moment this happens down to right here during this screen. I can't tell you if it happens at the beginning or the end of this screen, but at some point here, the random numbers that serve as the deciding votes on everything that's about to happen in the upcoming match, they're all made and stored somewhere at this point. So after observing this, what are some of the reasons one might opt to pre-generate random numbers for later use in a game like Pokemon Stadium, rather than just make them as needed? Well, the first and least interesting answer is for performance. 
Depending on the performance of the random number generator, it might not make sense to run it in real time during Pokemon matches while all sorts of other things are running in the background as well. Though, despite how complicated that description of choices with random numbers may have sounded, this is really typical stuff in programming. This sort of thing can be done in milliseconds, even back on hardware like the Nintendo 64 home console. They're typically not doing any intensive like input or output, they're just doing some math to make a random number. The, the time needed is, is almost negligible. I looked into the frequency of random number use in other N64 games for comparison, and nothing really indicated that there was any issue with the speed of these operations. So you know the bomb boots from Mario 64? You know how they kind of blink when they're chasing after you? Yeah, well apparently that's controlled by a random number generated about once a second. Mario doesn't use much RNG during gameplay, but seems to use it for aesthetic things. Supposedly capping out on some level at about 10 random number requests per second, with like, no performance issues. <laughs> and when you look at the context in which a random number is needed in a Pokemon match, I mean, you only really need to generate a few for every attack. I mean, it's, it's probably possible to do it all with one, but let's assume in the worst case where like four are used per move. One to determine a hit, one for critical, one for status effect, and another just for like special moves that include some other random choice, like, like metronome or something. So like in the worst, worst case, you need four fully fleshed out randoms before an attack is run. Which is nowhere near the peak that Mario hits, not because it hits a peak, but, but out of necessity. And it's probably nowhere near the maximum that Pokemon could hit, when you consider that while a turn is being executed, nothing else in the game is happening. Like, there's no user input, the game is just kind of running on autopilot, there's no loading or unloading of assets or resources, like, the entire stage is loaded at this point, the animations are loaded, everything is everything is there. So yeah, while generating the random numbers during, you know, a menu screen where really nothing else is happening might have a slight, slight impact on the game's battle performance, it's probably, like, inconsequential. And honestly, it's kind of smelly. I mean, of all the entities in the game, what should be responsible for determining if an attack hits? Well, the attack. Duh. The attack is the one that knows its own accuracy, after all. So why is an external generator making these decisions and passing them down the chain of command? It's just kind of weird, but I mean, again, a player is never expected to ever know this. So digging for answers, I looked into this more. See, the thing about random numbers is that, like, <laughs> they're kind of hard to make. I mean, you're probably familiar with RNG in games, right? It shows up all the time. But have you ever sat down and just thought, like, how do you generate a random number? Generation is a kind of thing that follows a process. Machines are things that do things. How do you make an algorithm or function that can output literally anything? Well, to spare you the details, you kind of do and you kind of don't. Most random number generators use methods that aren't truly statistically random, meaning that patterns can be recognized and that they can be predicted with time. For encryption and systems where security matters, this is really spooky. One of the places this is the biggest issue right now is in Internet of Things, or IoT. Like stuff like smart toasters and refrigerators and other random devices that connect to the internet for some added functionality. A lot of them have really, really poor RNG, making it all the easier for them to be attacked. Remember two winters ago when the entire internet just kind of got torn to shreds? Yeah, that was because large networks of hijacked smart coffee machines and the like started blowing up traffic all over the place. Random number generation is really, really important and you should care about it. If you can shine a light into the black box that everyone looks to to have their random numbers serve to them, then you can break into just about anything with significantly less effort. Look, I know my audience, and I know that most of you have never given this a second, let alone a first thought, but this this is really creepy, spooky stuff that happens in the real world that you should care about and you should stay on top of. Really everyone, for that matter, should, should kind of have a base level understanding of this sort of stuff, because what you see oftentimes, which is really, really bad, is that the people in charge of making important decisions about technology don't understand the technology that they're impacting. And then they come up with ideas or make recommendations that make no sense. So just, you know, stay on top of this sort of stuff, guys. Now, in games, the quality of random numbers doesn't really matter that much. Nobody's gonna try to predict your randoms, but what you do want to do is ensure that no observable patterns are repeated that ruin the experience for the player. Maybe sometimes you'll want to rig your own randoms to make consecutive values less similar. That's something I personally had to do in my stupid Spongebob game for that class. So modifying random numbers for the purposes of creating a certain experience, that's, that's totally valid. 
In Pokemon Stadium 2, the random number function used is this. Again, full disclosure, this comes from an article on Bulbapedia which it didn't cite its source for this specifically, but did include references to where it got details on the RNG in future generation Pokemon games. So I can't confirm that this is actually what it uses, but from what I've read about RNG on the N64, this seems reasonable and we really have no reason to outright reject it. You just you just have, have no idea how hard it is to filter the RNG challenge let's play videos from like searches for Pokemon Stadium random number generator, it's its its just not, it's not a possibility. Now you'll notice something there called a seed. You'll also notice that I never really answered that question about how random numbers can be generated. So this is a really basic function. You've got a multiplication and an addition, no biggie. But most of the better functions you'll see around make use of something called a seed. See, mechanically, it's really hard to generate a real random value because nothing about an algorithm is random. Algorithms are deterministic. What you can do, however, is neatly pack up some entropy from an external source and inject it into your function to make something significantly less predictable. If the system you're operating on has any access to the outside world in which things uncontrollable from the inside occur, then you can pass that along to the random number generator. From the temperature of the computer's components to the current date time to even static interference floating around from the freaking creation of the universe, all sorts of things can be picked up and used as a seed in a function like this. You're probably familiar with the example from Minecraft where before creating a world, it asks the player, a source of randomness, to provide a random seed. So according to my very reliable source back there, huh? In Pokemon Stadium, the seed used does come from operating conditions of the N64's hardware and the last generated random value. And then based on this, a random number of random values will be generated and then mashed together in an XOR to give the final result. So like, as far as generation goes, it's still not that performance intensive. And it goes above what's minimally needed for a game like Pokemon, especially given the time of this game's release. Still, this could be run in the background over just a couple of frames, if even one at all. This whole thing happens in like the blink of an eye. I always thought when I was a kid that it took into account things like idle time during the attack select menu, like, like it would reward you with the higher critical hit chances for faster decision time, but sadly no, the randomness comes from the count register. Anyways, alright, here's the point we're at right now. The Pokemon Stadium games don't generate random numbers live in battle right before attacks are executed. Instead, they pre-make a bunch of them and store them before a match even begins. So the question you should be asking, what does it matter? And the answer, it doesn't. <laughs> From the user's point of view, whether the numbers are pre-generated or generated at the moment of use doesn't really matter because the processes behind the random decisions in the game are obfuscated from them anyways. I mean, yes, generating a random number at the moment that an attack is launched would yield a different result than the one pre-generated because the source of entropy, the count register, would have a different value. So yeah, you would be generating a different random number, but does it matter? <laughs> No, not, not really. So why did I make an entire video about something that doesn't matter? I don't know. Welcome to the end screen. What a lot of people don't realize about a welcome to the end screen is that it's not a true end screen, unless you're yelling. I'm seeing a lot of people do welcome to the end screen challenges with a little bit of that whisper boy. So let me show you how it's done. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to the end screen. <sighs> I kind of just wanted an excuse to cover random number generation and I don't know, I just I think it's kind of cool. I mean, again, not that it matters, but think about this. Before a match begins, all possible outcomes of it already exist and are explorable. The deciding factor of the effectiveness of every action about to go down is already written. Your destiny is printed in this stack of numbers. It's it's already there, you just don't know it. Conceptually, I just I just think that's really interesting to think about. As I was playing, I frequently ran into situations where no matter what choices I made, there were no paths from my starting state to a success state just because the speed and stats of my Pokemon didn't shake hands well with the random numbers already set up for me. That's kind of how I discovered this. 
there was one match where I used Thunder and it missed, and I thought, hmm, wouldn't it be great if I could just reset and make Thunder hit? So I, I reset my state and I tried again, and it missed again, and I tried again, and it missed again, and no matter how many times I reset the state of the emulator, the attack always missed. Because even though I was resetting it, the same random number was being used over and over again to determine whether or not it would hit. But once I noticed this and, and learned about this and observed this, my behavior playing the game changed. I no longer just used previous save states to hard reset matches I was losing. I started holding on to multiple states at multiple points throughout the duration of a match, using one sort of master branch to explore the furthest depths of the battle's possible outcomes and random numbers. I would start observing the rounds at which an attack would miss, at which they would inflict a status effect or a critical hit. And then with this knowledge of what would happen on every turn, I would go back to the initiation of a match and start making weird decisions mid-game that at the immediate moment didn't make sense, but I was playing the long game. If I know that on turn four, the first move will be a critical, then I need to delay for a few turns by switching Pokemon repeatedly and then ensure that my Pokemon out is faster than the opponent's on that turn so that I can get the critical rather than them. I could use it defensively too, switching to resistant Pokemon on turns where I knew that a status effect would normally be applied to my dudes. The cool thing though is that status effects can be hijacked too, so like, if the enemy poisons or paralyzes you on a turn, if you manage to reset and use a poison or electric move on that turn yourself, you'll be the one who gets the status effect on them. It's super weird, but, but once I discovered this really pointless use of pre-generated chances, I just, I, I couldn't go back to playing normally. Despite knowing I, I was purely exploiting the game, I was having fun. Battles now became huge lists of events to explore all the possible outcomes of in order to optimize my strategy. It was like Groundhog Day, but a game and on a smaller scale than Majora's Mask. And even using these crazy cheap approaches to battles, mapping out all of the possible outcomes, I would still get stumped from time to time when late battle randoms were just not favorable to me. Some matches were still unwinnable, even after having my hand in the random stack. So I'm glad I discovered this. I don't feel so bad about the fact that I couldn't beat this as a kid anymore. <laughs> I mean, of all the matches I played, about 1 in 10 were unwinnable based on their Pokemon selections and mine, which at that point the numbers were already generated. Now knowing that, and since you have to fight all four Elite Four members and then your rival, all in a single session without saves in between, the probability that at least one of these matches will be unbeatable by you once you start is over 40%. Like, th that's nuts. So. Time travel mechanics in games are mostly exactly what you expect them to be. Which isn't to say that they're bad, I'm just saying that typically they're always used in a lot of the same ways. I don't really know any turn-based RPGs where you can roll back turns, and despite it not being an expected use case by the developers of Pokemon, deciding to implement random number generation the way they did for whatever reason allows, through memory exploits, one of the coolest time travel rollback style features to exist and be usable. A match that would typically be decided in just a couple of minutes can now have hours and hours spent studying every possible scenario and exploring ways to reach desired states at the desired moments and be the enemy's perfect opponent. I'm so fucking sick and tired of the Photoshop. Show me something natural like Emperor. Hello and welcome to the end don't realize about a welcome to the end screen is that it's not a true end screen unless you're yelling.